Every year, thousands of people die without leaving a will. If no relatives come forward, then their estates will go to the government. Keeping this money in the family is a job for the air hunters. On today's programme, the air hunters have to crack one of their toughest cases yet. Touching the straws, basically. As they battle to find the heirs to a £200,000 estate. We missed these births first go round. It's a really red hot now. It was a slow start, but I think we're on it now. And a vicar stakes his claim to a very unusual inheritance. There are still six empty spaces in this 12 person brick line vault. You know, I thought I might get buried one day as opposed to cremated. And who knows? That could be a, a slot. Plus, how you may be entitled to inherit some of the unclaimed estates held by the Treasury. Could thousands of pounds be heading your way? In the UK, two-thirds of people don't have a will. When they die, the law states that unless the authorities can find an obvious heir, their money goes to the government. Last year, the Treasury pocketed a staggering £18 million in unclaimed estates. That's where the air hunters step in. Pop back from Fraser and Fraser. There are over 30 companies who make it their business to trace the rightful heirs to this money and help them claim it back. Fraser & Fraser is one of the oldest firms of air hunters in Britain. It's owned by Andrew, Charles and Neil Fraser. They make their commission by solving cases and signing up heirs. Over the last 10 years, they've enabled over 50,000 heirs to claim over £100 million. It's 7 a.m. on Thursday at the company's central London office, and the Treasury has just published its weekly list of unclaimed estates. So that's it. Neil Fraser's first task for the day is to identify those with an obviously high value, which will earn his company a commission. And this morning, one case leaps out at him. Robin Hardy Palmer, who died aged 58 in West London. He died in Isleworth, but very, very recently. It looks like he owned a property. Now, that property is going to be anywhere between 100 and 200,000. So it's definitely worth us pursuing. I think we're going to have quite a lot of people working on this today. 200,000 pounds is a very large estate, and there's likely to be a lot of interest from rival companies. So the team are anxious to get started on this investigation. Robin Palmer was born with learning difficulties, and by the time of his death, he was living in supported independence in this property in southwest London. One of the strange things on this case is the date of death. It's very, very recent, um, which means it's very, very hard to get the information for us. It means we're working on a speculative birth. It's a bit of a gamble. Uh, fingers crossed it pays off. Because Robin has only recently passed away, his death certificate has not yet been registered, so the team can't immediately get hold of an accurate date of birth for him, which would give them a clear starting point for their investigation. So Neil decides to send Bob Smith, a senior researcher on the road, round to where Robin used to live, to see what he can find out on the ground. Bob's job, like that of all the company's travelling researchers, is to pursue any lead, no matter where it takes them. They make sure that when the heirs are eventually found, they are the first company at their door, and the one the heir decides to sign up with. But on the case of Robin Palmer, there's a long way to go before that. As yet, the office haven't even got a death certificate for him. So any information Bob can get will help get the ball rolling. Hello, sir. Do you live here at all? You don't, right? OK, thanks. There's no one around, and Bob quickly realises that he's not going to have much joy. But at least he's been able to size up the deceased's old property. Quite a nice little flat, actually. It's in a lovely part of Twickenham, so I would imagine that's got a bit of value. It makes me think that certainly this will be an estate that's worthwhile us pursuing. Robin had lived all his life in the family home in Kew until his mother died in 1987. The house was then sold, and because of his learning difficulties, Robin was taken into residential care. However, in 1993, with some of the proceeds of the sale of his former home, Robin then bought his own property in Twickenham. Although he lived on his own, he was helped in most aspects of his daily life by Richmond Social Services as part of their policy of supported independence. Hello, Community Support Services. Sue Rowe and Julia Moore 
looked after Robin for many years. We're both very fond of Robin. He was a huge part of both our lives, really. He was such a lovely character and such a pleasant man to be with. You know, he is a huge part that, that, that's missing now. I think Robin, having been an only child, you know, he was very much a loner. It did take a long time for Robin to come out of his shell. He was an incredibly shy person. Through having more regular contact with different people and simply getting out and about more with his carers, Robin gradually became much more sociable, which included becoming a regular at the local pub. As he got to know us all and befriend us, he would often sit down and have chats with us all and call us over to, to give him some help with the crossword or perhaps turn the television show over to the show that he wanted to watch. And he became more than just a customer, he became a friend to all of us. To see him on a Sunday sitting down having Sunday dinner with a couple of pints and chatting away, it was a joy. And, and I know that he got so much from that because he would say, I must go to that pub on Sunday. Robin's other great passion in life was the railway. He had a, a huge interest in steam trains, or trains of any kind, really, but steam trains particularly. When he went to the Blue Bell Railway several times and, and with Mencap holidays, he would go to other steam railways. You know, he, he loved anything like that. And we used to bring him magazines for these steam trains. Still have trouble go past Tesco's magazine rack without picking up the railway magazine. Um, that's probably harder than anything. I still see them there, because you can't... <laughs> Other people probably have to look for them, and they just sort of boom out at me. So, um, yeah. Twickenham took him to their heart, and uh, everybody knew Robin. If he was walking up and down the high street, people would often stop and have a chat with him. Everybody knew and loved him. They'd miss him right throughout Twickenham now, you know. It's, uh, you, you go down Barclays Bank, oh, where's Mr Palmer? You know, he was, yeah, he was a huge part of, of the local community. Back in the office, in the absence of any certificates, Dave Milchard, a.k.a. Grimble, has managed to piece together Robin's family tree using the census and online records. I'm not sure that's the birth here. He thinks that Robin's parents were Reginald George Palmer and Constance Raymond. Robin was an only child, so the team will need to look back to aunts, uncles and cousins to find his heirs. The main thing we're going to need is the birth of Robin Hardy Palmer. Yep. David's straight on the phone to Bob. He now desperately needs Robin's date of birth and his parents' marriage certificates to back up his research. Constance, most vital would be the marriage in September 1940 in Surrey, North East. OK, point. Bob's got his work cut out for him tracking down those certificates. So first off, he tries a shortcut. Hello, is that Mr. Office? How can I help you? We're trying to obtain copies of two death, uh, sorry, two certificates that took place in the 1940s in Surrey North East. Are you able to tell me which office we should go to? Not really, no. There's various offices in that time. You're going to need more information because Surrey um... is a nightmare. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Bob's shortcut has turned out to be a dead end. So he heads off to the first of many Surrey Register offices to begin his search for the vital certificates. Once we've got those two certificates, um, they give us something to work with and confirm we've got the right family. Meanwhile, in the office, Neil has been doing some detective work of his own, researching the maternal side of Robin's family tree. Looking at the mother of the deceased, her surname is uh, Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N-T, which is quite a good name. However, all indications are she's an only child, which means there won't be any first cousins on the mother's side of the family. Um, yeah. We're relying, therefore, on the, the, the Palmer side, the father's side of the family, which is quite a hard name to research. Um, we're relying on cousins on his side. Um, if we can't find any, then that's as far back as we can go, and it looks like the government will get it. The law in England and Wales states that in the search for heirs, you can only go back as far as the descendants of the deceased's grandparents. So if Robin really didn't have any aunts or uncles, then the heir hunt would end right there, and his £200,000 estate would be absorbed by the Treasury. The team are now focused on finding some heirs on his father, Reginald's side. We're st still fishing around for Reginald's birth. I'm now looking at overseas births. Touching straws, basically. 
We're in a bit of a problem, really, identifying the father. We're trying a couple of possibilities, but we've got nothing concrete at the moment. It's not moving, is it? <laughs> it's total stalemate. The maternal side is a non-starter, and without a date of birth for Robin's father, the team can't identify which Reginald Palmer he is. So any family trees they come up with will ultimately be based on guesswork. And Bob still can't find that marriage certificate. They can't find it here, but the trouble is it could be... It could be at Sutton, it could be at Kingston, it could be at Morden. Yeah, yeah. All right, then. Cheers, mate. Bye. Poor Bob is going to have to go to each register office one by one to try and locate this certificate. Fraser's have ordered a copy from the General Register Office as a backup, but that won't arrive until tomorrow, and the team are relying on Bob to track down the real thing today. Right from the beginning, Neil assigned a lot of people to work on this case because of its potential high value. It's a slow start, but I think you're on it now. So the air hunters are all feeling the pressure to deliver and earn the company some commission. Researcher Dominic has come across something that he thinks might just be the breakthrough they need. Gareth? Right, come and look at this. This is the most speculative thing you'll ever see in your life, but he's up to date on the phone. John took to about it. OK. Out of all the potential fathers for Robin, Dominic has found one who he thinks could be their man. And if so, he was married to another woman before Robin's mother. There's a George Reginald Palmer marrying Molly Moore. Looks like it produces one issue, Eileen J. Palmer, who would obviously be the half blood sister. Dominic is hoping that Eileen's son will prove to be Robin's nephew and their first heir. At this stage, they'll give anything a go. You're not gonna, are you going to call it? Or? I'll give it a call. Yeah. It's totally wrong. We were tracing down through a family name of Palmer. I'm believing that, that would have been your mother's maiden name. Was she Eileen? Elaine? And your dad was Raymond Wright? It wasn't. All oh, right, OK. Looks like I got that wrong. Um, were you born in Basingstoke? All oh, right. I'm sorry to trouble you. As David thought, the information that Dominic had provided was indeed wrong. So once again, it's back to the drawing board. This case is proving to be a very hard nut to crack. Coming up... Uh, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry, I'm reading this totally wrong. Neil uncovers a mistake that could cost the air hunters dear. We've made quite a disastrous sort of uh, oversight. But at last, they get the breakthrough they've been waiting for. I've got another one here as well. It's a really red-hot name. Inheritance doesn't just mean money. Sometimes heirlooms, cars, pets and, of course, property make up an estate. But occasionally, something very out of the ordinary is passed down to future generations. Air Hunters Hoopers are often contacted by solicitors looking for heirs. Oh, look, is that it there? But in 2009, Mike Tringham received a very odd request from a very old friend. This case came to my attention through a friend. Slightly unusual situation, but it did involve a question of inheritance. This friend was hoping he was the heir to one particular family heirloom, a grave. I've been asked some weird and wonderful questions and been posed some fascinating problems, but never been asked to actually discover who might be entitled to be buried in a particular plot in a cemetery. So in that respect, it really got my interest from right from the beginning. The plot in question contained the remains of a renowned Victorian family, the Bantings, and lay in West London's famous Kensal Green Cemetery, known as the Valhalla of England, because it provided the final resting place for the great and the good of Victorian England. Dukes, generals and even princes were buried here in splendid marble tombs and mausoleums. we discovered that there was plenty of interest in the surname Banting. One of the intriguing things we found was this 12-person brick-lined vault there in Kensal Green. The Reverend David Banting is a vicar of the Church of England and a keen amateur genealogist. He was convinced that he was related to the Banting family, who owned and were buried in this impressive vault. 
There are still six empty spaces. Well, that's always been an intriguing question to me. Who's going to use it? Who owns it? You know, I thought I might get buried one day as opposed to cremated. And who knows? That could be a, a slot. But David was unclear how he could discover if he was entitled to a space in the vault. So that's when he decided to call on his friend's genealogical experience. Mike decided to treat this like a normal air hunting case. I needed to discover who was entitled to what could be termed an asset, even though it wasn't a monetary asset. So I, I thought I would tackle it in that way by using my genealogical skills to establish a link between my client and the plot of land. David had done a fair bit of research into his background and had drawn up a family tree linking himself to the Bantings, who owned the grave site. David is one of three brothers whose great-great-grandfather was Thomas Banting. Thomas's brother, William, had a son called William Westbrook Banting, and it was he who had built the vault. In his research, David came across William Westbrook's grandfather, also called William, and there he uncovered a fascinating connection between the Bantings and their splendid final resting place. We discovered that his job was as an undertaker, but not just any old undertaker, he was undertaker to the crown. Bantings had had the royal warrant to bury royal bodies as and when needed. Between them, the Bantings were involved in some of the most important and celebrated funerals of the day, including George III and the great war heroes Admiral Lord Nelson and the Duke of Wellington. Bantings were also involved in the first great public funeral of the 20th century. Queen Victoria's funeral was a shambles. All sorts of things went wrong. Horse harnesses broke and people had to jump in and stop the coffin from skidding backwards and so on. Poor planning had dogged this momentous occasion because the Queen would not permit anyone to discuss her death while she was still alive. But Bantings and the royal family learned their lesson. And in 1910, Edward VII's funeral went off without a hitch and became the benchmark for future royal state occasions. Although Bantings were initially barred from Buckingham Palace by a grief-stricken Queen Alexandra. She was unable to let the body go. So Banting and all his men and horses and carts and, and were dismissed. The ledger says, went, not needed, 50 guineas. It happened three times, charging 50 guineas a go, which in 1910 is an enormous amount of money. In the early years of the 20th century, William Westbrook Banting brought the art of burial to its peak. The hallmark of a Banting funeral was grandeur and finery and what became known as the gorgeousness of grief. Many of these burials were taking place at the new and fashionable Kensal Green Cemetery. Kensal Green opened in 1833, but it didn't catch on with the public until many years later. When Frederick, the Duke of Sussex, died, one of the children of uh, King George III, then it became very popular. There was almost snobbery and death. Everybody wanted to be near the, the royal tomb in Kensal Green Cemetery. After that, it became the home of the great and the good, uh, particularly up until the last 50 years or so. And we still do many prestigious funerals to this day. For Lee, the Banting family tomb is a fascinating reminder of how things used to be done. Because of the, the current scarcity of land, uh, something like the Banting Vault is quite unusual nowadays. It would be very rare to have it now. First of all, because of the cost implication in buying a plot of land of that size, uh, it would be extremely expensive. In all, six members of the Banting family were buried in this vault. The last one, over 70 years ago, was Cecil Banting, William's brother. And since then, it has lain undisturbed. So Lee was surprised when David came to see him. Here we are. These are the grave details here. The grave is a large brick-lined grave. When his probate is a little bit unusual, then as much as nobody's been buried in the grave since the 1930s, usually interest would have waned by now and people are into new graves where there would just be a husband and wife put there. However, if there's remaining space in a family grave and you still have the right of burial in the grave, there's no reason why that can't happen. William Westbrook Banting had made his fortune from burying the dead, so he wasn't going to skimp when it came to his own arrangements. In 1901, he bought a large plot in the most prestigious part of the cemetery. 
everybody who was anybody was buried in Central Avenue, right outside the magnificent Anglican Chapel, which has the Royal Graves opposite. They're certainly impressive. They are. Like all the graves in Kensal Green Cemetery, the Banting plot was assigned a 999-year lease. William Westbrook spent what would then have been the princely sum of £24, constructing the tomb itself out of the highest quality materials, as this was the best way he knew to secure his family's position in society in perpetuity. You were telling me the quality of this. What can you tell professionally about professionally, the... Professionally, this is a granite monument, which is why it's lasted as long as it has, and yet it's still in fine condition. If we wanted to use this again, any member of the Banting family... You could certainly do that. The first thing you'd have to sort out would be the issue of the ownership. David's connection with the Banting family was only distant. So were his dreams of eternal rest in Kensal Green dead and buried? Or could Mike Tringham's research hand him the keys to the family vault? There are descendants of William Westbrook Banting who could be contacted, quite possibly living abroad, and I think it would be rather nice if it could be put to good use still within the family. Still to come, the air hunter's research finally begins to pay off. What can I tell you then? Right, so what... And the race to find the heirs to Robin Palmer's £200,000 estate is on. And we have now got a first cousin alive. Big Tiverton. Oh, fantastic. Um. For every case that is solved, there are still thousands that remain a mystery. Currently, over 3,000 names drawn from across the country are on the Treasury's unsolved case list. With estates valued at anything from 5,000 to millions of pounds, the rightful heirs are out there somewhere. Today, we've got two cases air hunters have so far failed to solve. Could you be the missing link? Could you be in line for a payout? Vincenti Luxa died in Newton Abbott, Devon, on the 27th of March 2002. Was he a friend or colleague of yours? Could you even be related to him and entitled to his estate? Joan Malkin, née Pele, passed away on the 30th of November 2007 in Waterlooville, Hampshire. If no relatives come forward, her money will go to the government. If the names Vincenti Luxa or Joan Malkin mean anything to you or someone you know, you could have a fortune coming your way. Unusually for air hunter Mike Tringham, on the Banting case, he's not dealing with a financial settlement at all. Could I get you to look something up for me? He's tracing the heirs to a family tomb. And after checking back through public records, wills and probate, he's finally settled the question of whether or not David had inherited a right to be buried in the vault. Hold oh, up, is that it there? There is a, an obvious link between David Banting's family and the family of William Westbrook Banting, but one has to go back quite a number of generations. They are related, but to such a remote degree that he wouldn't have any claim as the next of kin. This was a blow. Mike had just confirmed that David was not directly entitled to be buried in the vault, but he didn't intend to stop there. His next step was to find out who, if anyone, had inherited the rights to the grave, seeing as its builder, William Westbrook, had died a bachelor in 1932. I discovered that William Westbrook Banting was one of five brothers, um, and two of his brothers survived him, so they were the important um, elements of this inquiry. The two brothers who survived William Westbrook were Edgar and Cecil Banting. They were both named as his heirs in his will, so anything they received, including the rights to the grave, would have passed to their children. Edgar's two children, Lawrence and Gladys, both died unmarried, but Cecil Banting's line proved to be more interesting. There are descendants of William Westbrook Banting who could be contacted, quite possibly living abroad, so the likelihood of them um, desiring the use of um, that plot uh, here is, is unlikely, and I think it would be rather nice if it could be put to good use still within the family. 
Mike decided that his next step should be to meet up with his friend David. Hello, David. Hello, Mike. Hello. <laughs> Fancy seeing you. Very good to see you. Come on in. Thank Come you. In. Thank you. He wanted to present him with his findings so that between the two of them, they could compare notes and work out a plan of action. What we've established is that you are related to William Westbrook Banting and his family, but not, not really so directly that would give you direct right to the, the vault in Kensal Green. Professionally, you're saying this is actually quite a distant connection. And in legal terms, it is quite distant. Mm. But here are we thinking, goodness me, this is family, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if we were talking in legal terms about in inheritance, um, third cousins or even second cousins... Don't um, feature. ..wouldn't feature at all. Yeah. Not, not in English law. Yes, well, in a way, that's... Mike then revealed that even though David didn't have a direct claim to the family vault, he had discovered someone who did. William Westbrook's heir was one Christopher Banting, grandson of his brother, Cecil Banting. But, but, but you flesh that maybe we've got a proper name, Christopher, not just yes, William Christopher William Villiers. Mike had managed to trace Christopher to South Africa, but there the trail ran cold. When I couldn't find him in South Africa, I know there was a lot of immigration from South Africa to Australia, so I had a look in Australia. And, in fact, um, Christopher William Villiers Banting, who would be... Uh, a great nephew to William Westbrook Banting uh, is alive and well and living in uh, Western Australia. Uh, th that is big news. Mike's established that the rights to be buried in the Kensal Green Vault have passed to Christopher Banting. Now David needs to get in touch with his long-lost cousin and find out if those rights could be transferred to him. There is now a, a possible plan of campaign. I could send these Christmas cards yes, yes. To, to say, do you realise you have the best right to this? Yes. Uh, what's your response to that? Are you interested in it? I'm sure as a distant member of the Banting family and uh, being instrumental in, in bringing to everyone's attention uh, this vault, um, I think you have a strong case. Even though David is not legally entitled to be buried in the grave, Thanks to Mike's research, he can now pursue his wish to be interred alongside his ancestors in the magnificent Banting family vault. Cost permitting, of course. Because well, when I went to look at it, it would just cost an arm and a leg mm -hmm. to open it up and use it again, because really? it's so big and so fine. Yes. I mean, the lump of granite so on top of it is, we reckon, three tonnes, yeah. five tonnes, I don't know, to lift it off. So you'd have to be fairly determined to, um, to make use of it again. Oh, that's a wonderful phrase to yeah. use. <laughs> The case of the Banting Vault has been a truly unusual one for Mike, but what next for David? Not only has he been given the chance to resurrect an old family tradition, he's also got a long-lost relative in Australia to contact. Who knows, the next step for me is to be in touch with him, and if he's not interested, who knows, one day I might be buried in Kensal Green Cemetery in a vault. I'd better start saving. Pity that vicars are not paid at overtime, isn't it? Fraser and Fraser have been investigating the case of Robin Palmer, who died aged 59 in Twickenham in London, leaving an estate that could be worth up to £200,000. Because of the size of the inheritance, the team have high hopes for this case. There's always a little edge to a case that you're working on where you know there's probably going to be a value. But the search hasn't got off to a good start. They couldn't find any relations at all on his mother's side and trying to pinpoint Robin's father was like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's a palm such a bad name. We're just getting lots of marriages all over the place. Neil's double-checking the birth record he had found for Robin's mother in Devon when he suddenly gets a nasty shock. Uh, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry, I'm reading this totally wrong. Ignore what I've said. Neil had thought that Robin's mother was an only child, so he'd told the team to stop searching for heirs on her side of the family. So we've got Raymond, Raymond. But it turns out she was actually one of five. The other four had been registered as Raymond rather than Raymont. They'd been missed because the team had forgotten to do a routine check for alternative spellings of unusual surnames. I've got another one here as well. We missed these births first go round. It's a really red hot name. Robin's grandparents were Richard Raymond and Francis Maud Kentills. 
who married in Devon in 1907 and had six children, including his mother, Constance. All these children and their children are heirs to Robin's £200,000 estate. Dave gets on the phone to speak to the heirs and make some appointments. And you have a brother, Robert? Rodney, sorry, yeah. All the family seem to have stayed in Devon, so they need to get someone down there as quickly as possible. Neil calls senior researcher Paul Matthews, who's already on the road. Paul, Neil. Hi, Neil. Although I said there weren't any issue on that mother's side... There are births, aunts and an uncle of the deceased. And we have now got a first cousin alive. In Hitherton. Oh, fantastic. Um, Really, I wanted to find out how far away he is from Tiverton. Uh, he's uh, 45 minutes from them, so that, that's quite good on us. And just overhearing on, on Dave as well, it doesn't sound like anyone else has contacted this beneficiary, which is uh, a bit of luck, really. We've, uh, we've made quite a, quite a disastrous sort of um, oversight on that, but uh, it appears uh, it hasn't hurt us too much. It's still only 10 o'clock, and with Paul on his way down to Devon, this case could still have a positive outcome for the team after all. The first heir that they've traced is Stephen Raymond, Robin's first cousin, who, along with his two sisters, stands to inherit a share of Robin's £200,000 fortune. Who's the mayor, Paul Matthews from Fraser and Fraser? How you going on? First of all, Paul has to establish that Stephen is actually Robin's heir. It's like, it's like, it's like a big jigsaw. Yeah, yeah. I just find out what you know yeah. proves you're the right person. Um, total number of children of your parents' marriage. How many of you are there? Three. Three of you. Was your dad married more than once? No. Paul's satisfied he's got the right person. And Stephen's happy to sign up with him and delighted to hear he's coming into some money. So good news all round. Right, thank you very much for your yeah, time. Nice you meeting you. Yeah. Hope you get a nice sum yeah, of money and all the very best for the yeah. future. Bye-bye. Right, Paul can't afford to hang about. It turns out that the team have found 17 of Robin Palmer's maternal cousins and heirs living in the Devon area. I'm now up to see another cousin of the deceased and his brother. And then when I've seen them, apparently I've got uh, another three cousins to see together. So it's, it's even more chaotic than normal. With a bit of luck and a lot of legwork, the team have managed to transform this case from a lost cause into an air fest. There's so many of them that Paul's swamped. So Dave gets on the phone to another senior researcher, Ewart Lindsay. Are you at? Hi, Dave. I was going to get Paul to see this one tonight, but he's already seen two groups of people. All right, Dave, good stuff. Ewart sets out for Devon. I'm going to Newton Abbott. Nice place. I've been there many, many times. It'll be several hours before he gets there, but if he's going to make it for a 7pm appointment, there's no time to lose. Meanwhile, Bob Smith is still looking for that elusive marriage certificate for Robin's parents that the team hope will unlock the paternal side of this case. Luck a copy of a marriage certificate for me. But he's not having much luck. Quite often you can pick up stuff on the day, that's the reason. Yeah. But if you can't find it, fine. Oh, Cheers, yeah. bye. Again, we've had no luck. Um, I'll just have to let the office know and uh, we'll have to apply for it in the normal way and just wait until tomorrow, really. The team are now relying on the General Register Office to send through the marriage certificate tomorrow but they continue to work up leads in the meantime. Gareth's come up with another potential father for Robin. This Reginald George Palmer was also born in Devon and was part of a large family. I'm quite confident now it is right. So we're working uh, all these Palmers. says uh, he's got seven brothers and sisters if it's the right family, which hopefully it is. The signs are looking good, but David is still feeling cautious. They've connected, so these go together. OK. OK. Right. If it is right, well, we've got all the work done. If it turns out to be wrong, then we're all back at the drawing board and have to look elsewhere. So, until we get the certificates back, there's no way we can say we're right or wrong. At least the maternal side of this case is progressing well. Ewart's arrived in Newton Abbott, just in time to see another of Robin's cousins. Veronica Elliott, known in the family as Sally, is one of two surviving daughters of Robin's aunt, Zena, both of whom stand to inherit a share of their cousin Robin's £200,000 estate. Uh, hello, Mrs Elliot, how, how are you? I'm fine, thank good, you. Good. Nice to meet you. Come here. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank what you, can I tell you then? Sally is eager to give Hewitt as much information as he wants about her family and her childhood, growing up in rural Devon surrounded by her cousins. Keith would be 60, 59. But there is one cousin that she fell out of touch with a long time ago. The last time I saw Robin would be maybe almost a year after his mum died. He's always been an unusual child, but a loving boy. Very loving boy, big chap. It turns out Sally hasn't seen Robin since his mother died. He was a very, very rich man the last time I saw him. Very rich man. You say rich man? Well, the house was sold and he had all the money and... His parents' gen- house. Yeah, they both had died. And, um, I mean, hundreds of thousands. We're signing the top yet. After she's heard Hewitt's presentation, Sally decides she's happy to let Fraser's represent her and signs up. Thank you very much. In total, the team have managed to represent six of Robin's cousins from the maternal side of his family. But what will the new day bring for the paternal side of the investigation? First thing in the morning, and Neil is standing by the fax machine, ready to receive the marriage certificate from the General Register Office. The problem when we work without certificates is it's a real gamble. Although the mother was from Devon, um, it, was, it was always a little bit of a gamble that the father was from Devon. Sadly, it turns out that their speculative family tree for Robin's father was wrong. Unlike his mother's family, Robin's father wasn't from Devon. His marriage and birth certificates show that he was actually born in Wilsdon in London. But there is some small consolation for Gareth. Look at this lovely tree. There's only going to be two people on it, maybe three. Whereas the other one we did yesterday, there were hundreds of people. Robin's father, Reginald Palmer, had three brothers and sisters. His sister, Winifred, married Duncan McPherson Skeen, and they had one son, Duncan. I've got a phone number. What's the time in Australia? Uh, Victoria's about 10 hours plus. Suddenly, the search moves even further away from Devon. It turns out that Duncan had emigrated to Australia. But that isn't going to stop the air hunters. They managed to track him down to Victoria, where he had married in 1969. Sadly, Duncan died in 2004, but the team have discovered that he has three living children. They are first cousins once removed to the deceased, so they're they're beneficiaries. Um, We now represent them, and I'm quite pleased, really, with the outcome, having... uh, been able to uh, find them all the way out in Australia. In the end, Robin's estate was officially valued by the Treasury at £190,000, which will be split between his 21 heirs. Although at the time he died, Robin had no contact with his family, he was looked after and treasured not only by his official carers, but by the community as a whole. The funeral went beautifully. It was a really lovely send-off for Robin. Sue had arranged for a tree to be planted in Robin's memory at his parents' grave, where his ashes had been scattered. All his friends then gathered at his favourite pub to toast their good friend and one of Twickenham's favourite sons. It was a lovely day, very special. It was a very nice day. He would would have enjoyed it. (laughs) Yeah, he would have had a pint with us, wouldn't he? Yes, most definitely. He would have certainly raised his glass and (laughs) said cheers. Yeah. If you would like advice about building your family tree or making a will, go to bbc.co.uk. Next on BBC One, meet the family who sampled life in New Zealand, wanted down under, revisited. Then at 11, the best of homes under the hammer, including a property with a wonderful sea view.